should we change this start? Sorry. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like to introduce this session. Uh, this session is the second part of the session on Xylella vectors and uh, will be chaired by Berto Ferrez from CSIC, Instituto de Ciencias Agrarias in Madrid. So enjoy the presentation and the discussion. Good morning, everybody. So uh, we are going to continue the second part of the session on vectors and epidemiology, insect vectors and epidemiology. So uh, the first presentation, which is going to be right now, will be by Jean-Claude Gregor from the University of Bruce Brussels. And he will talk about the distribution and phenology of five potential vectors of Silella fastidiosa in Belgium. Good morning. I would like first to thank the organizers and EFSA to have made my communication here possible. And uh, I would like also to remark that there were so many interesting and thorough and complex presentations on this topic that I, I feel quite humble because I'm going to present a rather modest contribution of a few preliminary steps regarding the, the vectors of, uh, the potential vectors of Xylella fastidiosa in Belgium. And last, uh, I'm speaking here on behalf of the first author of this uh, communication, Severin Hasbrook, who could not make it. So the origin of the project I'm presenting here, it, it's a, a Belgian project, in fact, called Xileris, gathering the Université Catholique de Louvain. Claude Bragard is here. Ilvo, there are several members of Ilvo here, and, and our lab. And one of our, of our tasks was to investigate the potential vectors of Xylella fastidiosa in Belgium. And the second task I would like to emphasize was to work on, to uh, investigate uh, on the possibility of using these potential vectors as spy insects uh, on, with the reasoning that um, insects carrying the disease uh, uh, could be easy, easier to locate or to sample than sampling the plants which are diseased. So we started from uh, a work done by EFSA uh, analyzing potential vectors. And uh, this work concluded that some species are very widespread over Europe and very ubiquitous in the landscape. And so we decided to select some of these species, which are uh, the same as most of them are the same as those which have been described in earlier presentations, Cercopis vulnerata, Afrophora salicina, Cicadella viridis, Afrophora alni, and uh, Philenus pumarius, which is known as the vector, at least one of the vectors in Apulia. Uh, and so we have these five species, and I put here the map published by EFSA showing that, in fact, these five species are present all over uh, the EU. And, and so our question was how uh, distributed and how present are they in Belgium? And actually, we didn't know that because there were no real data about it. And the first thing we had to do, because we are not specialists of emipterans, was to, uh, to, to uh, undergo some kind of training. And we were welcomed by uh, Domenico uh, in uh, his lab in Torino, and we were duly briefed about uh, the different uh, Afrophorids and uh, Cercopids. And so we started by looking at the Belgian collections. So th there is no, nothing known so far. There was nothing known so far. So we investigated the Belgian collections. And then we used also uh, citizen science. So there is one website in, in Belgium called observation.be where uh, amateur mostly uh, record their findings. And so we use that, of course. Th this has to be taken with some caution because not all the findings are substantiated and verified. And then we had also our own field surveys. And because we had to design these field surveys in a small amount of time, we tried to optimize um, our movements so that we could investigate uh, across the whole of Belgium and uh, uh, look at as many sites as possible. So there is no real 
sampling strategy uh, aimed at particular plant species. We were using sweeping nets with a kind of fixed protocol for sweeping the, 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 the vegetation, and it was mostly the ground vegetation which was investigated. And so what we found was, in fact, a confirmation of our expectations, which, were that, which was that, in fact, uh, the species were mostly widespread. So here you have in, uh, in blue our own samplings, uh, in uh, yellow the citizen science uh, data, uh, and you can see that they are more abundant in some parts of the country, and this represents probably it's a bias con constituted by the proportion of entomologists or amateur entomologists in the different parts of the country, and the red uh, were the, uh, the insects found in the collections of the uh, Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences. So Philenus spumarius prevent everywhere. Then we have another species which is not so much present, and that is uh, Afrophora salicina. Uh, which we found in, in some locations, and, but you can see that obviously there are much less records than Philenus pumarius. Then another one, Afrophora alni, uh, living on alnus, uh, on older, and uh, this one quite wide, uh, widespread. And then uh, a species which, for some reasons that I'm going to discuss with you later, we found interesting. It, is, it was Cicadella viridis. It is a species uh, egg-laying on juncus in rather humid uh, environments, but we found it in many places, and I will come back to it because I think it offers some prospects in terms of laboratory studies. And then last, um, Cercopis vulnerata. Uh, that was interesting because uh, uh, we found that in terms of phenology, it is a species which is extremely restricted. And so if you, if, uh, to, to show you the adult phenology through our different samplings, uh, I prepared this graph showing that the adults of uh, the, the four species excluding Cercopis were to be found in, uh, uh, in most of the, the growing season. But Cercopis, actually we missed it the first year because we started the sampling in June. And actually, the, the adults uh, appear in May, and uh, they, they seem to be disappearing in June. So it, it seems to be a species with a very short phenology as an adult, which I think could be an interesting feature to be kept in mind in terms of risks, because it doesn't, uh, well, it doesn't appear as an adult so, uh, so long. So we had also a series of uh, observations in a greenhouse and in a plastic tunnel under natural conditions, and that was to have a, an idea about a general rough uh, and incomplete, I must say, idea about the biology of these species. And uh, we uh, ended up with a few findings which are not new, not, uh, not original, but at least we learned something, and, and so I want to share it with you, although it is not original nor new. So we, we found where and how Afrophora salicina uh, oviposits, and that is in the uh, terminal twigs. The eggs are inserted in the twigs, and in many cases the twigs break down and fall down on the ground. So it's a really interesting indication about the presence of uh, these species uh, on, on willows. But we found the, the species also on uh, herbaceous plants. And then we uh, also had a few observations regarding Philenus pumarius, but here our experience is much, much less than uh, uh, that of other co colleagues which presented earlier today. And then we also uh, looked very much at Cicadella viridis, which oviposits in uh, Juncus. And uh, that, that was fascinating because, well, you can see the, the red eyes of the, the, the nymphs here, the, the, well, the the future nymphs in, in, in the eggs, and you can see how the, uh, the, the stems are slit and the eggs are, are laid into the, the slits. We, we further found also that th there was a, a fair amount of parasitism, probably by a mimarid uh, wasp uh, and probably Anagrus incarnatus, but it still needs to be confirmed. So th this is interesting, but uh, marginal and incomplete, as I told you. 
Um, we had the possibility to follow the development of Cicadelet viridis in the lab. And that was interesting because we found that this species could be reared continuously in the lab. There is no diapause. So it is, it is possible to have several generations a year and to keep a culture in the lab, which might make it very useful for transmission experiments. But maybe it's not a very competent vector. This is something we don't know. Uh, so we had also information on uh, Afrophora salicina in terms of immature development. But this species is a univoltine, a fixed, uh, straightforward univoltine species. And so uh, its use as a laboratory animal is a little bit limited. So um, what we found was that, to conclude, was that uh, those species that we followed in the lab, uh, mainly Philenus uh, uh, spumarius, Afrophora salicina, and Cicadella viridis, the two first uh, have one generation a year, and the, the last species, Cicadella viridis, we can cycle it in, in the lab. So to conclude, regarding this distribution, uh, so I, I still uh, apologize, it's very preliminary. The species are very widely distributed across the Belgian territory. Uh, all, of the, all of them are univoltine except Cicale de la Viridis. Um, Cercopis vulnerata has a very, very narrow time window in its adult phenology. And uh, uh, all, all, all of them are polyphagous, except that we found Afrophora salicina only on, on salix, on willow, and all overwinter as eggs, except Cercopis vulnerata, which overwinters as nymph. Then we also tried to uh, test the idea of spy insects. So the idea was that the insects traveling from plant to plant may be a good indicator of the presence of xylella. And so Claude Bragard, who is in this room, uh, analyzed hundreds of specimens of uh, the insects that we caught with our sweeping nets. And uh, for the details of this analysis, uh, and if there are any questions in this respect, I would direct you to Claude, who is obviously more uh, competent than, than me for that. And uh, I must say that at this stage, we, we are quite curious and quite excited because pending confirmation, it might be that our spy insect strategy uh, could be rewarding, but uh, it is too early to, to say more about that. So to conclude <laughs> this brief presentation, um, the potential vectors are at least some of those potential vectors because we limited our numbers, as you have seen, to five, are present throughout the Belgian territory. Uh, the life cycle, uh, the adult life of some of the species is protracted over the whole season, uh, but that's not the case for Cercopis vulnerata. Uh, uh, Cicadella viridis is uh, multivoltine. Uh, Cicadella viridis is locally very abundant. These are data, data which I did not give you here, but you, you can find hundreds of individuals on one, one square meter. We, we, we just uh, did some sampling. And um, Claude has developed a multiplex PCR technique for uh, detecting both Xylella fastidiosa and the insect vectors. Uh, so uh, you don't need to, to go to determining the insect using other criteria. And uh, Claude has also developed a high th throughput screening of the collected insects. And we have quite a few uh, organizations and people to, to thank. Thank you very much. OK, so we are moving to the second talk of this session which will be uh, Chris Malunfi from Fera Science Limited, UK, and he will talk about the potential insect vectors of Silela fastidiosa in the United Kingdom. Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. Um, I'm very happy to uh, have this opportunity to talk to you about potential insect vectors of Xylella fastidiosa 
in the UK. Again, I, I feel as if we, we've had some absolutely amazing uh, talks full of data collected over several years and some really fascinating results. I think my talk's going to be a little different. It's going to be rather simple. So hopefully it'll give your brains a rest. Um, originally, my talk was planned, what, what, what we had planned at the beginning of the year uh, was to do a sort of systematic survey of um, high-risk areas where uh, potentially infected Xylella hosts were imported into the UK. So we had planned to do, get the, our plant health and seed inspectorate to inspect nurseries and places where Xylella hosts, imported Xylella hosts, had been planted. Um, unfortunately, that's been postponed until next year. Perhaps um, the British government has to save money to pay off the, the Brexit bill. So we've gone through a rather cheaper option and went for citizen science. So the first point of my talk is to try and identify the potential insect vectors. Uh, this is quite straightforward. If you want to uh, look at potential vectors of a xylem limited bacterium, you look for the xylem feeding um, or Chenarinka bugs. We commonly call them hoppers. So all the xylem feeding or Chenarinka bugs are potential vectors. There's only 18 xylem feeding potential vectors in the UK assigned to four families. So the numbers of species in the UK is much lower, perhaps a half or even a third of what are found in parts of southern Europe. And it's a fraction of what is found in the, the tropics. We heard some excellent talks regarding Costa Rica and Brazil. It's never quite that simple. So sometimes phloem feeding insects can occasionally feed on the xylem or at least be in contact with the xylem and possibly pick up um, the bacterium. So uh, obviously it's been well publicized that Eucellus linealatus, which is a phloem feeding insect in olive orchards in Italy. There was quite a high instance of these phloem feeders picking up the um, Xylella fastidiosa bacterium. And we have four um, Eucellus species present in the UK. And as there is a potential for them to pick up the bacterium, they are potential vectors. And really this could apply to other large-bodied species um, of cicadelids which although they feed on the phloem there is a there is a possibility that they could pick up um, the bacteria from the xylem but only Phelanus spumarius has been confirmed as a vector in Europe so far so all I've done is just sort of list the um, 18 um, species of xylem feeding uh, potential vectors. I also just added the, um, the four Eucellus species, although they're phloem feeding, at least one of them has been found to pick up the bacterium. <coughs> and as an entomologist, I like to see pictures of whole insects. So I just thought I'd indulge myself and include some pictures of the, the insects that are the potential vectors. Um, Apart from Phelanus spumarius, possibly the most important potential vector is Aphophora alni, the um, older um, hopper. This is because it is prolificous, it does occur on woody and herbaceous plants, it's widespread and it's relatively common. Um, another species which is common in the UK, Neophelanus um, campestris. Um, these are some more sort of frog hoppers. We only have one species of, of Cercopus. You just need to cross the channel and you can pick up several others. So our fauna is, is fairly impoverished. And we have some of the uh, leaf hoppers. Cicadella viridis is relatively common, but it's really restricted sort of, to sort of grasslands. And finally, there are some more um, cicadellids. We have one cicada recorded in the UK, but as that is probably extinct, it's unlikely to be a significant vector. It hasn't been uh, seen or re recorded or heard for several years. So, which species are most likely to be um, important vectors, key sort of vectors in the UK? So we did, uh, we, we did a comparison. We looked at the known distribution in the UK, the abundance of each of the species, uh, where they occur, the habitat, and the host range. Most xylem feeding or, 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 or bugs in the UK are restricted 
the species-rich grasslands and marshes. And uh, there's a very low probability of them coming into contact with um, hosts that are infested with um, Xylo fastidiosa. So this sort of restricts the uh, numbers of uh, potential hosts greatly. However, in the UK, um, the host range for many of these bugs on the continent is much greater, or at least the records of the, of the hosts are much greater. And there's a high degree of uncertainty regarding the host plant range for many of the species in the UK. Uh, this is because the adults may feed on a much wider range of plants than the nymphs. Climatic conditions can influence what the hoppers feed on. So in dry conditions, herbaceous feeding species may switch to woody plants. Now in the UK, uh, for example, last year we had a very wet summer. We, we rarely get sort of drought conditions where something like Phelanus primarius would have to move from herbaceous plants onto woody plants. So the incidence of um, Phelanus primarius um, on woody, hearts, well, sorry, woody plants is low. It's, it's, it appears to be much higher in the Mediterranean, particularly in areas that have very dry summers where the herbaceous preferred hosts dry out. So the, the conclusion of what are the most likely, what's likely to be the most important factors in the UK, not surprisingly, came to the, the conclusion that Phelanus fumarius appears to be the, it's, it's the mo it appears to be the, probably the only um, key, likely key vector species in the UK. You have a lot more species in, on, in the Mediterranean, so things may be different. But uh, Phelanus fumarius is uh, fairly unique in the UK or different from the other species that we have. It's the most common, widespread, broadly prolificus. It, it can sort of switch um, hosts. It occurs in a wide range of habitats, including anthropogenic. And the thing about um, Phelanus fumarius, it's occasionally found at commercial nurseries that are importing um, Xylella hosts from the continent, so that there is a potential pathway of introduction of the bacterium into the UK um, via Phelanus spumaris. So, uh, as I'd mentioned, we originally planned to do a more systematic survey with our plant health and seed inspectorate. Um, uh, that's ha that had to be postponed, so we decided to, uh, or at least DEFRA commissioned the International Plant Sentinel Network to carry out a citizen science survey of spittle bugs. So they produced a poster and informing um, people what to look for, the spittle, and also to um, tell them the reasons why, because part of this was sort of public, en public and stakeholder holder engagement, trying to get the people aware of this uh, uh, disease and the potential sort of impact. So the aim was to collect records of spittlebug distribution and their host plants. And spittlebug is absolutely ideal because the, the, the foam protective covering around the nymphal stages of the spittle is very distinctive. Um, and there were two ways to um, uh, pass information on to the um, International Plant Sentinel Network. And one was tweets for the young and trendy people and we asked them to send in photographs um, of the spittle, of the host, give details of the location and the type of habitat. And uh, they were using the, has ha the hashtag spittlebughunt. Then for older people like me, who don't know anything about tweeting, um, you had the option of using emails and sending the same sort of information uh, with photographs to a contact in DEFRA. But not only that, um, the, one of the problems, of course, with citizen science is verification. So we also asked a number of um, people, primarily in botanical gardens, to collect samples uh, in plastic tubes, send them to us. Uh, those are still preserved in uh, ethanol, and we're waiting to sort of sequence those. So what happened? You, you, it's always unpredictable when you're trying to use citizen science. Well, in the, in the first sort of month when we um, um, sort of uh, advertised this, we had 65 tweets with photos attached from uh, 20 participants from all over the UK and the Republic of Ireland. And I've been involved with quite a few citizen science projects. And usually when you ask people to send photographs, they often send you a lot of rubbish. They send you the completely wrong insect. 
So um, I was very pleased that we had almost 100% accuracy. When we asked these people to send in photographs of the spittle, um, that's exactly what they did. So uh, it was quite impressive. I think it shows how this is such a useful um, target for citizen science. We also had 78 records by email, uh, most with um, uh, photographs. And the, this is from a smaller number of participants, some of which are actually entomologists who are keen to get involved. The, we had photographs of the host plant. So um, verification, we were able to verify the, the host plants and these were confirmed by specialists at uh, the Botanical Gardens, spe uh, specifically uh, Kew Gardens. And we received um, just over 30 samples of nymphs which are waiting to be sequenced. So um, the locations, um, the host plants and 30 plus of the samples, that can all be sort of verified. So what did we find? Uh, we actually um, recorded, and it's, it's only sort of 140 odd samples, we recorded 55 different plant species, uh, many of which were actually sort of new records for what we strongly suspect of Helenus primarius. And rosemary was the most common host. Um, not only that, we actually found the, uh, the, the plant species were assigned to something like 25 families. Um, the most common families we found that, that um, the spittle bug was recorded on were Asteraceae, as you'd expect, but also Rosaceae and Lamiaceae. Um, this is because uh, most of our records came from private gardens and also uh, botanical collections. And what we were recording, most of the actual hosts that were recorded are also um, hosts for Xylella fastidiosa. There are also things like rosemary and lavender are uh, major hosts that we import, which are clearly represent a potential pathway of introduction from um, the Mediterranean into the UK. So we, we, we've, um, we've concluded that this is a rapid and cost-effective way of gathering biological data. But much more importantly than that, um, it's, it's a way of engaging and educating the public and the other stakeholders. Uh, one of the um, problems is that if Xylella fastidiosa is detected in the UK, the actual um, uh, the actions uh, under the current legislation are fairly draconian with the destruction of potentially large numbers of plants, of, of Xylella fastidiosa host plants. And we need to get the message across to the public and stakeholders uh, beforehand so they are aware of this potential high impact disease. Um, so there would be more acceptance um, if, if we did have to sort of move in and start destroying uh, large numbers of plants. Uh, the, 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 the sort of summary here is the results just from the tweets. And although it's difficult to make out, we, we quite literally had uh, records from all over the country. So looking um, forward, the uh, research that, that is planned, um, we are a partner in a Eufresco project on Xyla fastidiosa and its insect vector. And there's a whole range of things that uh, we need to sort of develop um, in the uh, UK. Um, capacity building to make sure that we have an effective method of detecting Xyla fastidiosa. Um, we, um, we're, we're actually developing uh, morphological and molecular diagnostic protocols for all developmental stages of potential vectors. The reason being is that the difficulty in the morphological identification of the nymphal stages. And we also, we want to, uh, well, we're planning to carry out a survey of high risk commercial sites uh, with the Plant Health and Seed Inspectorate. Uh, we, we, what we'll be looking at is um, nurseries that are importing the um, Xylella hosts um, from the Mediterranean where the, the disease occurs. Um, and the sort of methods that we're going to be using um, are uh, the visual inspection for the, for the spittle and the adults, 
Incidentally, the, 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 the spittle, the first um, spittle in the UK, was detected in April up until um, the end of June. We're also going to be using sticky traps and um, use where we found sort of um, potential, ho potential vectors. We're going to use more intense if collecting using sweep nets and pooters. Uh, finally, we're still trying to sign off the uh, DEFRA contingency plan um, for Zayella fastidiosa in England and Wales. And I'd just like to end on sort of saying thank you to um, a couple of people. Jennifer Hodges, who's uh, here today, who's going to be sequencing the samples. Dom, um, Dominic Eyre, who um, was working on this project with me. And Catherine O'Donnell from the BGCI. Thank you. Okay. So now uh, we are moving to the next talk uh, by Crescenza Don Giovanni from the Centre de Ricerca, Experimentación y Información in Agricultura Basile Caramia uh, in Locorotondo, Italy. And she will talk about preliminary evaluation of different insecticides against Philenus spumarius. So, uh, good morning to everybody. As I said, uh, Dr. Ferres, I report the first preliminary results regarding the evaluation of uh, different insecticides uh, to control uh, the vector uh, Philenus spumarius. Uh, to reduce uh, the spreading of uh, the disease from plant to plant or also in uh, a long distance, it is uh, important to control uh, the vector. And uh, in the first stage, uh, the control, uh, the juvenile uh, um, uh, ve vector, when they have on ground uh, vegetation, um, be uh, before they move, they uh, become adults and move on uh, the canopy. Um, the control of uh, uh, the juvenile is uh, simple, but uh, using a uh, working uh, soil. But uh, there are some areas that are uh, difficult to, to uh, uh, um, reaching with um, um, uh, motor um, operation. So uh, we have uh, tested uh, different products in order to evaluate the effect against uh, juvenile of uh, Phenel, uh, Philenus uh, spumarius. Uh, the product that uh, we have tested are reported in uh, this slide and uh, is uh, delta metrina, uh, imidacropirid, uh, buprofenzin and uh, two inert compounds that uh, kaolin and uh, rock dust and uh, also uh, a natural substance, the sweet uh, citrus oil. All uh, the products were applied uh, in a single uh, application, with an exception in uh, one trial where, uh, where the same product were applied uh, two times after three days. Uh, the application starting when uh, the first uh, four instar uh, appa um, appeared on uh, the field uh, trial. Each plot uh, were organized in, uh, with uh, 22 uh, plot uh, random uh, randomized uh, for time and in each uh, plot uh, were um, individuated a subplot uh, for the evaluation of uh, uh, the uh, ground uh, vegetation uh, present at the uh, general level, the number of split present in each uh, single unit, and the number of uh, juvenile for um, each uh, split. Uh, using unit uh, as in uh, this image. Uh, before starting uh, uh, the trial, we have arranged the uh, plot in order to avoid statistical difference among the considered th uh, thesis uh, regards the number of uh, the speed for, uh, for the each unit and the number of instar for uh, the unit. As reported uh, in uh, this slide, no difference are uh, present uh, for each uh, treatment in each trial that we have uh, carried out. For uh, trial E, 
um, it is uh, evident the best uh, results of uh, delta metina that uh, eliminating uh, completely the presence of uh, the juvenile in uh, the plot where we have tested the product, uh, while the other uh, uh, treatment that we have applied um, give um, re, um, uh, was more or less uh, effic efficacy. In uh, trial B, we have tested uh, a lot of uh, product and uh, we have uh, 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 tested also imid imidacropid and uh, delta metrina and imidacropid have the same uh, result with uh, completely reset to zero of the population of the juvenile that are present in uh, each plot where we have um, observed um, the nymphs. Uh, while um, the other products that we have uh, tested have uh, less uh, effic efficacy, but um, they, they differ from untreated check without uh, different among them. them. Um, with a, a, an Abbott index that ranged uh, from 30% uh, in the thesis treated uh, with zeolite to uh, 60% in the thesis treated uh, with kaolin. The same uh, results were, uh, were obtained regarding the num uh, number of instances present, present in each uh, spit. In uh, trial C, as I said, we have tested uh, imidacropyrid, uh, um, kaolin and squid uh, oil uh, in single application and in uh, double uh, applica application. Uh, Confidor reduces the number of the split to 5% and um, in double application uh, eliminates completely the presence of the instar. Um, the, in uh, this case, the effect of kaolin is uh, uh, more effec uh, uh, mo less effective, and while uh, more effective um, is the action of the sweet citrus oil that uh, showed an Abbott in index uh, than uh, 30% percent and in a double uh, application of uh, 40%. Percent. Then we have uh, set up a different trial in order to evaluate different insecticides against the adult vector uh, of uh, Philenus uh, spumarius. Um, uh, in uh, this slide are uh, report all the products that we have um, applied. At now, no uh, products are authorized in Italy for the control of the uh, vector. For a, a limited period of the ta time, uh, only acetamiprid and sweet citrus oil uh, was uh, reg registered. But at now, uh, no uh, product uh, can be applied. Uh, in the, the field for this, uh, this specific uh, control. We have uh, used uh, different systemic insecticide and then also product that potentially can be applied in organic farmer, such as uh, azad azadiractina, uh, piretrina, spinosad, and sweet uh, citrus oil. All products were tested in uh, a spray application with the uh, exception of imidacropyrid and uh, dimetoato that uh, in uh, one trial have applied also in uh, endotherapy. Uh, applied from each brand we have uh, put a gauge um, a bottle that releases uh, the product uh, within the plants. Um, uh, Philenus uh, were collected in uh, the area uh, where it is uh, present and then uh, the live adult of uh, Philenus were put in a cage. Uh, from uh, each uh, uh, treatment we have uh, um, organized uh, um, uh, two replication with uh, three cages from each uh, replication. 
the in, uh, insert of the Philenus Spumario within the gauge were uh, put before, before the first application and then after three days and uh, seven days for trial A, E, B uh, and uh, C. Then uh, after uh, the uh, application, three days after the application, seven days, uh, uh, 10, uh, 15 days after the application, we have evaluated from each gauge uh, the percentage of uh, the uh, ad uh, insects. Uh, this is um, the results regarding the first field uh, trial. Um, a highest uh, abut uh, value uh, were observed in tesi treated with uh, delta metrina and acetamiprid. Uh, less low is the activity of imidacropirid and uh, lambda chalotrina and etonfenprox. Uh, uh, then uh, the uh, persistence of this uh, product uh, gradually uh, decreasing while uh, the metoato have a um, low effect, um, more uh, lower than 10%, uh, while pimetrozine and puprofenzide uh, non are able to control uh, the, the vector. In uh, trial B, uh, we have the uh, same resource that we have obtained in, in uh, trial E, uh, with the high effect, uh, prompt effect of uh, imidacropirid, delta metrina, lambda chalotrina, uh, acetamiprid. Etofenfrox have, have a less effect, but a good effect in the control of the, um, the vector. Uh, the persistence of the, uh, all of this product um, give uh, af after uh, 15 uh, days. Uh, while the metoato applied in this trial in two uh, uh, kindly of uh, formulated have uh, as uh, um, in uh, um, previous trial a uh, less effect uh, in comparison to the other uh, considered uh, treatment. Spirotetamat, that is a, a, in a, an insecticide that moves in within the plants in a, two direction, um, that we uh, think that have a good action in the control of this uh, vector, uh, non, uh, not have a specific action in uh, reducing the population of uh, the finance fumarius that we have put uh, within uh, the, uh, the gauge. Uh, and it is uh, uh, confirmed the low action of uh, pimetrozine and bu buprofenzine. In uh, this trial, we have tested organic product uh, in comparison to confidor. It is evident the highest action of uh, imidacloprid and the low action. Uh, activity uh, of the uh, tested uh, organic product that we have uh, used in the, the trial. In uh, trial T, uh, uh, D, uh, we have put a prefixed number of insects before the application and then we have carried out different assessment, but uh, after the application uh, we have put uh, other insects within the, the trial. In uh, this uh, trial, uh, we have evaluated the effect of uh, uh, sweet citrus oil at two uh, different volumes. The normal volume that we have applied in uh, the other treatment had uh, um, a high volume in order to wet in completely uh, the vegetation. When uh, sweet citrus oil were applied uh, in, uh, in this mode, we have obtained uh, good results with uh, uh, high prompt effect of the, uh, of the pro products. Uh, but then the pest instance uh, is uh, complete, uh, completely uh, nullified because uh, we, are, we have introduced within the gauge and prefixed the number of insects, the number that of the uh, insects they had one subsequent. Minute. One minute. One minute. <laughs> uh, uh, not not uh, increasing. 
Um, this is, uh, in this slide, it's uh, evident uh, the high effect of uh, all the neonicotinoids that we have uh, tested. Uh, in, uh, imidacloprid that uh, was tested also in endotherapy uh, have a slowly uh, preliminary activity and then, then uh, equal to uh, imidacloprid tested uh, in spine, while dimetoato tested uh, in, uh, in two mode have a uh, high uh, action as compared to dimetoato applied in uh, spray. Uh, it is uh, not time for other other trial. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are moving now to the last talk by Francesco Porcelli, Università di Studi di Bari, and he's going to talk us about a predator, the Cellus renardi, an assassin bug candidate for Philenus spumarius biocontrol. So, pointer? Okay. Well, first of all, let me to thanks, deeply thank the organizer of the Congress and all the system that permit us to be here because it was, is a great opportunity. And then also I wish to thank regional government because also supported part of this study. So I wish to, I must, and I am pleased to be grateful to them, Dr. Dr. Anna Percoco and Dr. Silvio Schito. Let's go, I will tell you the story. I, okay. I will tell you the story of an interaction of a, uh, a predator, and that is Zelos Renardi, that comes from Nearctic, with uh, uh, our beloved Xylella vectors, Philenos pumarius. Uh, this is the scheme, more or less, of my presentation. I will start with the very early event that was the introduction in Europe of uh, a psyllid, macro motoma gladiata, then the fortuitous introduction of Zelos in Greece, and then in the rest of Europe till Portugal, uh, and the Zelos in, at this point did the prey shift, so encountered the species coming from extreme orient, and uh, enjoyed it very much, became the main predator on ficus, or ramental ficus in, in I mean, uh, all, I, I can say it all around Europe, because I found in, uh, in uh, Alicante, in Spain, uh, in Madrid, uh, in Bari, in, in um, yes, in several, in Greece also. Then we will move about on the study of bionomics of the predator, the, on the prey acceptance, on first artificial diet acceptance, and then on the actual situation that is the study on, the, on a possible full artificial diet. Macromotoma, uh, I think most of, of all have just seen it, is very spread in Europe on ornamental ficus. It causes uh, extensive um, twig shortage and plenty of fluffy white walks uh, on, on the twigs, tops. Uh, this is the first, actually, first encounter of Zelus feeding on macromotoma on this infested figus in Bari. I will go fast on less relevant topics, of course. And these are the first picture of, of the experiment I did on my desk in my office, trying to breed, successfully trying to breed the Zelus feeding by macromotoma that I collect in the field. It feed on juveniles of uh, nymphs of uh, the psyllid on adult. And uh, also, it uh, is also cannibalism from adult by adult on last list, last or second uh, penultimate uh, um, instar nymphs. Um, we was able to close the cycle, getting uh, mating and egg layings in, in captivity, and we realized that the species, uh, of course, fertile eggs we have brought here. Um, we was able to understand that at that time it was a species easy to breed in captivity. So it was prone to stay in small boxes, uh, no problem with temperature, and um, friendly, you can friendly joke with him, but also be bited occasionally if, if you are, I mean, hard enough touching him. Uh, recently, with the advent of the Philenus problem, we started um, testing the ability of uh, Zelus to catch different preys. Of course, we focused on different orders. And we realized soon that it preys diptera, is enjoy very much uh, Drosophila suzuki, um, small moths, lepidoptera, 
uh, enjoy very much Emiptera, is mealybugs and also Iscide, uh, doesn't enjoy white fly. Um, maybe the question is connected with um, because white flies are slow moving uh, insect or no moving insect at all, as, as of course as, as uh, juveniles. Maybe they do some acquire some honeydew or sweet from uh, sweet features of this semiptera, but I'm not sure they can occasionally feed. Sure, the uh, white flies are not the target for this species. Uh, also, um, Zelus prey very huge prey, two times, three times its, its size. Uh, he has for sure a very lethal saliva, because as I, they, they are captured and, and stinged, they stop moving immediately. And uh, the Zelus can eat on each huge prey one more time, even in the following days. So it also use prey that it killed days before. It is interesting because of, uh, uh, you can understand easily, the, the problem with the predator is to have a huge amount of insects to feed them, to have a mass rearing. Um, also, it enjoyed the um, um, Aminoptera symphita larvae. We presume that any kind of mowing, preferentially um, wax-covered insects, will be accepted. Uh, then, from a couple of years ago, we started to do systematic observation because at the very first approach, I mean five or seven seconds, we put a, a filenus with a zealous in a, in a vial and it takes five seconds to kill it. Immediately the predator oriented through the, through the, um, the filenus uh, did some, it's very funny because it's, an, it's a gentle killer. It got there quietly, okay, I'm a friend, don't worry, I will touch you with the antenna. Put the anterior legs over, the anterior le legs are covered by glue, and then suddenly take the prey, sting it. Usually phylenia is stinged at, at, at the first perococcus membrane, but the, the phylenia is, is dead in, in one second or less. Um, and we realized soon also that it um, feed a lot. It can, we did a simple experiment. I spent my uh, 2016 August with uh, several individuals in my bedroom, and I have vials and doing observation while watching TV or, or playing music or writing some things. And I realized uh, as more filenos I give them, as more they kill. Eventually they kill and release immediately, but they, they kill and they search for killing. This is another interesting Fasio because it's not truly an ambusher. It can do active search for prey, slowly moving, walking, looking around. Very, um, you, you can see you very well from one meter, one meter and a half. It moved on the opposite side of a twig just to not to show itself. itself sure. um, this is, we did the first series of experiment. I mean, homemade experiment. Uh, what we saw is that uh, there is a time to feed, a time to attack, and a time to rest. Um, then we do a massive uh, Drosophila melanogaster, um, I mean, um, praying experiment, and you can see the numbers. In 16 days, each of 14 Zelus renardi prayed up to 110, more or less, um, Drosophila, so they, they do killing continuously. It's like a joke, like a, like a play for them. This year we moved on more, I mean, um, systematic experiment, and we offered uh, in 70 different uh, um, experiments, we offered five filenus per zealous in order to measure time for feeding, time to, to attack, and time to rest. What we know today is that females prey considerably more than males. That is expected because females need time, need, I mean, proteins need food to set up egg clusters. Uh, but both male and female uh, are um, active enough. Um, one more interesting um, feature is that there are individuals that prey much more than others. Is, I mean, is a, I mean, 
personal behaviors. Some one are very, I mean, prone to pray. Others are more calm, spend the speaking with friends. I don't know. Anyway, uh, why I, I put your, your attention on this? Because uh, we believe there is a considerable room for create uh, not a super predator, but anyway, to select best, uh, best praying male and female and, and get um, a top praying uh, brood or, or strain, let me use this term, it's not properly, best praying population of the predator. One more um, step of the story is that we used, we tried to use Armonia axiridis as, as a prey. And this was, the results of this experiment was very surprising because zealous prey Armonia, no way. Armonia, as it, it is stinged, stop moving, but Armonia survives the attack. And this was, is for us very, very interesting because we are doing experiment, um, targeted experiment now, to understand if Armonia, once spread, is able to reproduce or not. Because in the case, in the case it's not able to reproduce, um, 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 Zelos act more or less, uh, you can say there's a parasitoid. We have some parasitoid in Cocinelli, Perillus Cocinelli, that is able to leave the host living, even in, unable to, to give a, a new brood. Uh, or it will be interesting if, if Armonia still maintained its capability to lay, to lay eggs, because in the case we may use Armonia as a source for natural, occasional uh, natural food in a, in, a, in a breeding otherwise oriented versus uh, artificial diet. <coughs> and here we are to artificial diet story. We, did, we closed the cycle with liver, as I told you, and then we started developing a partially artificial diet with a component of liver. We cannot use liver by chicken, possibly because of, of um, antibiotic charge in chicken breeding, but we can use uh, liver from, um, from ox, from different, from, uh, I mean, um, lamb or for different uh, vertebrates. Uh, sure, the most intriguing story on the side of the, of the diet is the use of fully artificial, that white on left bottom in the, in, uh, in the frame, uh, fully artificial diet, because of course this will give up the opportunity to, I mean, to um, uh, have plenty of diet available for breeding every time, year, all year round. That, that is the problem with the predator mass, bre mass breeding. And the step further is now running, uh, our ability to create microcapsulated diet, because it will be easy stored in pharmacological, pharmacological water, in, at low temperature and uh, can be very easily be dispensed for the use, stay in the petri dish for days without drying. Uh, we, we are not completely satisfied from the solution we found up, up today, but we are working with uh, also studying physics and uh, I mean technology of the microcapsulation in order to, off to offer to the, um, to the predator, I mean, a big mass of food inside the capsule, that that's appears to be the problem. Actual capsule, microcapsule can give small reservoir of, of food, this different <coughs> darkened area, and possibly the, um, the zealous uh, take some time searching into the, the um, microcapsule, the, the proper site to take food. So spend a lot of time, so feeding is not very, very natural. At an, the end of the story, I feel, I'm, I'm really pr um, proud to thank a lot of persons that have been working on the, of the story. Some of one is here in the room. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you for all this person also. Thank you very much. So now uh, we are uh, going to go to the questions and discussion section. We have about half an hour and um, we are now open to anybody that wants to make a, a question to the speakers of this session.
Well, one question there. Here. Good morning. It's a question for Claude, but uh, for Jean Claude, but probably more for Claude. I wanted to know your multiple, your uh, PCR. Uh, is it a real time, a conventional, and what is it based on? The one you're developing to detect at the same time the vector and xylella. I'll, I'll, I'll give the floor to Claude then. Conventional multiplex PCR targeting or skipping genes that we see against. And I heard that this uh, PCR is also to identify the insects, the vectors, at the same time. That's the idea. That, that's the idea, yes. Yeah, there is a question. Uh, hi, uh, so thank you for the presentations. They were very interesting. I was, um, I have a question um, in relation to the viability of these uh, strategies like insecticides and um, also um, insect predators. Uh, how possible is to use them to control um, Shilela vectors? Uh, because they are not very specific, right? So they could also affect other insect populations that are not the target. Um, so what would be the vi viability of using this um, uh, in all areas that are affected? Thank you. Who answered? Maybe me? Maybe yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, wish to speak? <clears throat> Thanks for the question. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a couple of hours, so I will be synthetic, but I wish not to be unclear. Um, what we are speaking about? We are speaking about uh, control of a pest. Um, we target the vector because we can, ta can target, <coughs> till now, we can target the, um, the bacterium. So the control is made for economical, economic issue, I presume. We are, we are, your question is based on the um, production side of the story. That's really, I'm, I'm wondering, for example, um, how would they affect, for example, pollinators or other insects that are not? As you, as you know, pollination in olive is due to wind. There are not insect pollinators. Okay, okay, but uh, first, second, okay. we wish, we hope that pesticide, insecticide, or predator will affect other insects. Will affect pest insects. Okay. So the idea, the strange idea that we have to use one formulate for one species on one plant, um, from my point of view, is wrong because this forces you to use many formulate on the same plant during the year. So uh, for sure, Zelos is able to kill, not, not, was not a case I show you, Lepidoptera, Hemiptera, Blatodea, was the range of major insect pests in olive. So we wish that targeting mainly the vector timely before it is able to transmit then the predator will give his um, contribution to the olive management orchard, being in organic, being in, in EP, EPM organic, being in EPM conventional, killing out other pest insects. Because this will minimize the use we will do about for insecticide, conventional insecticide, or by uh, organic ad, organically admit, admitted formulates. Well, will I, have I replied to your question? Uh, I think you did. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. 
Um, it seems that we have a very widespread vector and very few insecticides to choose from. Is there anything known about development of resistance in Phyllenus pomarius or other potential vectors against insecticides? Is it possible? Is it frequent? What can we expect? Still for me? Well, I, I thank you very much for leaving this question. <laughs> well, um, resistance um, is a phenomenon drive, drive by intrinsic ability of the target species to do something. Um, for sure, driving by the, on the number of brood per year for the chemical pressure uh, and several. Uh, Being the Philenus uh, univoltine, so one, one brood per year, uh, it appears, um, I mean, we may have resistance in aphids, in psyllid, but uh, with the, the, I mean, the um, changing in molecules and in formulates we have now in EU, possibly the formulates will change more rapidly than, than a possible resistance acquisition in the target organism. I hope. In the case of predator, of course, there is may, may, may we dream about a, a behavioral resistance, so changes in behavior, selection by the predator on the population of the prey, and thus the prey stay living, uh, they live because they have a different behavior that take them out of the pre predator activity and then multiplicating among them the they will change the behavior of the pop, but I mean, we may dream about this by the time. Yes, uh, over Alberto. there, there is a question. Donato. Yes, I have uh, to report one uh, question uh, from uh, Dr. Silvio Schito from uh, Region Puglia. Uh, I just it, thank you. <laughs> is on the same topic. Uh, he's asking uh, uh, if uh, you you can give some more details about uh, how many and uh, which are the, the the insect species that the predator prefer for uh, for feeding, and if among this you have an idea of if, if there are different proportions, if there are more preference for one and less for another, the first part of the question. Following this, uh, if you have uh, already data on, uh, on an evaluation of the impact uh, that uh, such kind of a predator uh, may, may have on the biodiversity of the uh, yeah, of the fauna. Thank you. Thank you very much, of course, for the question. Um, please mind that uh, Zelos is in the area from years. So we didn't perceive till now any kind of uh, malevolous, um, uh, I mean, uh, action of this predator. We, we got possibly five or six years ago is, is spread. We found on, uh, in campus area, in the field, just have to search for it. Uh, what we wish, we dream to do, is to do a mass breeding to make free adults or sub-adults, more or less at, at the time of uh, um, insecticide spraying, so just before flowering of olive. Because we need, they have mass spraying on Philenus feeding on uh, tender twigs of olives. Then we expect uh, the population stay up, but we expect also it will decline till, till the winter. So we will not to establish a new level of a predator. We wish to use it like a living insecticide. So truly biological control. Not classical, because we did not introduction. It was introduced by itself. Neither inoculative, ne we can say it about sort of inundative biological control. control. So we, we don't expect any malevolous effect. <laughs> of course, uh, biodiversity has a different meaning if we speak about, uh, I mean, park area, reserves, um, area with the special biological, but it still is hit there. So what, what we have to check if, if we have been doing damages uh, till now. 
Yeah. Fue traductor de todo, ¿no? Miguel Ángel. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Alberto. Um, well, I, I understand uh, it's also a question or a, a comment for uh, Professor Porcelli that there is there's been also only it's here only um, lab test, not not semi field. I'm here. Sorry, no, sorry. Yeah, I, I was I was asking you that that all the trials you perform with this predator are in, in the laboratory laboratory base, not not yet semi field or field. No, but it works in the field. It, it works on. Uh, it actually reduces um, checked the macromotoma gladiata on fecus in urban area. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but but uh, for Phileanus espumarius and so you didn't check yet. No, field, no, that, that's, that's good because we, we, that means we need a huge population that we must put in the field at the correct time. Yeah, just wanted to be sure. Yes. Mind <laughs> that we have a previous uh, mechanical control right. to, on juveniles. So in general the idea is to lower the population maybe of 90% per year because control is cumulative. So 90% first year. 90% of the 10% second year, 90% of the 10% of the second year, you know, yeah. in doing a time at the, um, minimum till age, we can call it, or anyway, uh, with um, crushing or smashing um, in correspondence of the fourth, fifth nymph of Philenus, and then use insecticide and predator against the residual adults. Right. So this is just a component of a IPM strategy. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I mean, it's and also a, a, a little question for Crescenda. What would be your recommendation in uh, according to your results in terms of of the different insecticides to use? Um, in neonicotinoids, have the same effects uh, and. Uh, uh, prompt effect and also uh, pyretroid. Uh, the persistence is uh, about uh, 20 days for uh, this product, while less efficacy are uh, the pyretroids. Right, but neonicotinoids are not very popular lately, so, <laughs> <laughs> as you know. Yes, but, uh, <laughs> yes, but uh, um, also uh, within the organic product that, that I haven't had time to uh, speak, uh, spinos had a good uh, effect. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I pass to Domenico. Yeah, Domenico. No, not anymore. Okay, no, there I is a question over there then. Or Joao, do you have a question? A uh, uh, question for Crescenza. If you have information on the systemic effect of uh, these neonico neonicotinoids in olives, have you, have you tested uh, any drench formulations or? Yes, we have uh, uh, keep uh, the sample for the evaluation of the uh, movement of uh, the, uh, the systemic insecticide in uh, the plants, <laughs> but uh, the activities are, are ongoing. Yeah, I, I had a comment regarding the use of exotic general natural enemies. Uh, I have real doubts about that. Uh, I mean, I've been involved during most of my career in biological control using specific predators. And in this case, they are aiming at a given prey. And here we are dealing with a species which is an introduced <laughs> species with a very wide range of prey uh, with the possibility if you mass release it to have it shifting to something which will not be the target. And so I think it will be probably not cost effective because of the cost of producing tens of hundreds of thousands of insects. And, and also it might turn out that, it, that, that these insects would attack other prey. So I think this is not particularly uh, to be advised and a good example was given in one of your slides where you showed us this assassin bug attacking Harmonia axiridis, which was a disaster. I mean, Harmonia was a disaster. Uh, and I'm really very much concerned that any introduction of other generalist exotic predator could be a similar disaster. 
Uh, I agree, but we don't introduce it. <laughs> What's well, yeah, I, I agree with that. It's not only a problem of introduction. It's a problem that if you are mass rearing and you are releasing an insect that you don't know the uh, negative effects it may have, then you will have a new pest probably, which is being controlled by natural enemies, which are already established in the area. So um, I don't say it will not work, but you need a lot of tests before releasing. Uh, yes, I have a, a question, but with a small preamble uh, concerning the control of the vector and uh, uh, the experiment that uh, have been carried out uh, in Apulia. You know, in, uh, in Apulia we have uh, a, con a regulation about uh, compulsory containment measure for, for the, uh, the, the disease and the bacteria, and uh, one of the pillars of this regulation is the control of the vector. That is compulsory uh, in the, all uh, the limited area, so I mean the infected and the buffer uh, area. Okay, we saw that uh, the, uh, the mechanical con control of juvenile stages, it seems to be uh, very effective, uh, work in the soil, because the, the, the insect vector is there. But uh, we saw in two years of application uh, uh, that uh, sometimes it's difficult the application of this compulsory measure. Uh, because uh, not all the areas can be uh, worked uh, properly, and especially the area that belong to the uh, public uh, uh, administration. I mean the border of the street, the public gardens, and so on. So I hope that uh, these new findings could, could find uh, a solution to update this containment measure uh, to, be, uh, to be applied more uh, widely, um, I, I say. But uh, my question is, uh, um, uh, what are the uh, steps, technical steps, in order, for example, to, to be able to use uh, some uh, uh, insecticide on, on the weeds to control the juvenile stage where it's not possible to, to, to work uh, mechanically, for example. And uh, a second uh, question is uh, against the uh, Sure. It's not a question, it's just an information. As far as I know, very recently uh, there, is, there was approved, uh, registered the first uh, active ingredients is acetomiprid uh, on the adults because uh, also in the containment measure uh, is strongly suggested the, the control of adults on olive. But uh, there are up to now no uh, legal products registered because you know in Italy it's necessary to register the active ingredient both on the crop and on the target. So for example, acetomiprid was registered for olive but on the fly and on, uh, uh, on the moat but not uh, on phylenos. Now I, I know uh, recently was registered the first mo molecule uh, on the, uh, also on, uh, against uh, phylenos. So, uh, my my, I hope that uh, this information could be used to, uh, to improve the containment measure, but uh, what are the procedure, technical procedure, to, to, to be able to use this, this tool for containment? Okay. Uh, regarding uh, the uh, juvenile stage, I think that uh, the uh, optimum period is, is uh, the uh, four instar of the juvenile when there are uh, a peak of the juvenile in the, in the field. Uh, and so in, the, in this time we they add all the population that are present in, uh, in on the ground vegetation. Uh, while uh, regarding uh, the using uh, of insecti insecticides on adult, effectively at now no product can be applied because no product are authorized and uh, it is uh, necessary uh, the registration. Only um, uh, acetamiprid it is uh, authorized but uh, for a few period and uh, I remember uh, in, uh, uh, during August, set, uh, September, when uh, it is in the uh, uh, optimal, optimal period for the control uh, of the adu adult. If I have a slide, uh, can uh, Yeah, yeah, you can put it, yeah, sure.
Uh, we uh, and uh, with the colleague of the CNR uh, have uh, monitoring uh, the population of uh, Finellus spumarius on uh, different olive orchard uh, for a few years and uh, we have observed the, the same uh, uh, trend of the uh, Finellus spumarius on uh, olive tree and uh, it is evident uh, the peak of the population uh, of the Finenus pumarius uh, in uh, generally in May. This is the result of different olive orchard in Bari district uh, and this is uh, the result on uh, Lecce district. Uh, the peak in Lecce is uh, uh, before, uh, re, uh, is compared uh, to Bari because the temperature are more high. And so the uh, the time to uh, use the product against the uh, adults vector is when they move on the canopy. But, but um, the adults are on the olive tree all, for all the period uh, of the season from May to October. And so uh, I think that it's necessary to control the adults also uh, this, uh, in this period because it is uh, an ag, uh, or, uh, 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 one individual to uh, transmit the, the bacterium. Uh, um, on the base of our, our observation, the product have 15 to 20 times of the uh, persistence and so uh, each uh, uh, 20 days it is necessary to control the, the vector. Yeah. Just, just a short, I mean, um, remind. Uh, at a very early appearance of adult, we maybe we have not all the population that have, have taken the ability to transmit. And more, the first period, so, so I mean transmission during the flowering time of olive, will tune the invasion of either to healthy plants. So those person, me, and I include myself, concerned about the use of, uh, and also as I'm sure, concerned about the use of of insecticide must mind that if we, if we not stop adult first approach to transmission at a very early start of summer, we lose that battle. Maybe we lose the war if we not stop the invasion of new territories. So it's crucial to lower the population in general, but more crucial if we have a, a rich population to kill adults before they take the bacterium for infected <coughs> plant and transmit, move and transmit the bacterium to healthy plants. Otherwise, we are losing time, the war, and everything. I will add one thing to that comment. If transmission occurs in one, two, three minutes, which looks like it's possible, uh, there will be many insecticides, or probably all of them, which we are, will not work at all to avoid uh, the spread of the bacteria. So I think the way to go is to kill the nymphs before they become adults. When they are adults, it's too late. So I don't think it would be a good idea to spray the, the, the olives itself, but to try to target the nymphs that are underneath the olives or another sources, because uh, transmission may happen in, in very short time. Alberto, I agree completely with you, but we, we measured up to eight millions per hectares. So we have not mechanical tools efficiency so high by the time to even to drop down the population from one million to 1,000. So your, your, your approach is correct within three or four years, if we do our best to down the population in general, so it will work. In the meantime, we, we can do from this year, but we will lose more territories, so we wish to minimize the, the invasion and then to move to a milder control without chemicals, as, as you suggest. So I agree. No, I, I suggest that you could use chemicals, but you should target the nymphs. The nymphs are the most likely stage I'm where sure, you can target most, that. Most. There are parts you can't act on. 
public, uh, I mean, dry, dry, dry uh, borders, uh, public soils, uh, abandoned. In Italy, it's not possible by, by law. Yeah. The problem is also to, to prevent mm -hmm. and protect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions? I think we have still, yeah, five more minutes. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Roditakis. I come from Greece. We don't have Xylella still there. So uh, the discussion that was just initiated was a very interesting one, and the presentations were excellent. Uh, just highlighting the importance of a very important tool, which is insecticides in the eradication and containment, which is our main target because we don't have Xylella. So my question is, when insecticides come into the game, one of, of the first things to do is to establish a method, to validate the method and establish a method that will be able to evaluate the efficacy of the products you are going to be applying. Usually these methods are robust and repeatable and under controlled conditions which will be laboratory. IRAC is an organization that is using and promoting such uh, methods. It can also be uh, used thereafter for resistance detection, which is unlikely, as already said by Professor Porcelli. But one of the main components that is missing here is such a method, a method which should be developed and be widely acceptable for evaluating insecticides. All the methods being described, which are very nice today, are field trials. Field trials, semi-field trials, contained in environment are subjected to different environmental conditions which is changing from time to time. I could see your results in imidacloprid, let's say. Once it was 50%, the next was 90%, which is a variability can't be explained when you're doing field trials. But has anybody considered this in this room to build a team to find a single widely acceptable method to evaluate insecticides? That's my question. As in my knowledge, we are about four teams, maybe five, working with, the, I mean, structured trials in field, uh, using more or less uh, a broad spectrum of formulates, but having a common core of molecules. So we are, you see today just that of uh, ANSA, but uh, there, there was, there are on course and will be the next year, repetition, 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 with core, a core of molecules and formulates and some, I mean, border, border formulates. Uh, we have very different point of view. From my point of view, just to give you an idea, the use of um, contact insecticide must be avoided because in olive orchard to kill by contact uh, I, I have, um, I mean, a reminder about the use of um, um, pyrethroids at very early and the consequent uh, uh, mite infestation in olive orchard because they revealed to, we have a, uh, to have um, an effect that improved the um, prolificity of mites. So uh, even, even on, in my mind, even pyrethrum is most dangerous than uh, um, imidacloprid. You may think I'm crazy, but, uh, but if you spray, if you use or better inject imidacloprid or dimetoate, you do secondary selectivity, so just sucking insect will be killed. And you have any uh, impact on environment because the uh, molecule is, uh, I mean, is into the plant. Don't, don't go out. <coughs> One action by midacloprid in such a way is much more useful than the 2022 action by pyrethrum you will be forced to do. One day, one day yes, one day no, because you need a window to control the, the, the vector of 15, 20 days. Okay. So at the end of the story, you have to use plenty of pyrethron that will kill everything. 
and will be less effective okay. also. Yeah, we are out of time now. So thank you very much to everybody, and now it's lunchtime. <laughs>